Hi, welcome to my talk. The topic is learn from area one to pack parser the hard way. My name is Kerr, and before start this talk, I want to briefly go through this photo. So the photo is came from a famous show in Japan called Sasuke, and later getting popular around the world called Ninja Warrior. And let's see how player play this stage. So as you can see, player need to jump from one bar to the other bar. And eventually reach the goal, and player need to jump it twice. And this stage is one of the most difficult stage in the game. It's called cliffhanger. It knock down tons of great players in this stage. Why I talk this thing in this topic? It's because I want to mention how I felt when I prepare this presentation. So I want to deliver such. Feeling for you, and hope you can also experience it. And let's talk about our agenda.、Uh, today, agenda we will cover many many points. You can see listed here.、Uh, the first one is my motivation of this talk. Later, what is parsing C Python, and、uh, later dive deep into parser technologies, and from one hundred one to one hundred two, and finally C Python impact parser and tech away. Let's talk about my motivation. My motivation came from the release article, "What's New in Python 3.9." In that article, there's one line say, "Pack 617, C Python now uses a new parser based on Pack." And when I read this line, my impression was, if I remember correctly, I took a compiler class in school, so I supposed to know it. However, I check what I learned in school. I found out score taught us the brief concept of compilers front end and back end, and score's parser assignment mostly used Python plus Yuck. And I immediately figured out my brain was lost. Yeah, here's a list of question I asked myself at that time, and this is also today's talk objectives. What is pack parser? Why did Python use area one parser before? And why did Gitto choose pack parser? And what other parsers do we have? What's the difference between those parsers? And finally, how to implement those parsers? So the first thing we need to learn is what is parser in C Python. You can find this in the below tutorial called C Python Dev Guide: Design of C Python's Compiler. Here is the Python compilation steps. Initially, we have the source code, and、uh, usually, you know, we just write run the Python command and、uh, generate the result. And what is under the hood? Here is the steps. The first the steps is called lexer. So lexer will parse your source code into a bunch of tokens. At this time, token has no meaning. So parser, today's main character here, will basically.、Uh, Parse those tokens and run some semantic analysis, and eventually generates a meaningful syntax tree, and we call it AST. I will explain this later. And now we have a tree. Tree will go through another compiler process and output bytecode. Bytecode later can be executed by VM virtual machine and generate the result. That's what you can see on the screen. And if virtual machine detects some other import module, it will go through the same process and yet again generate the bytecode and the result. Let's take a deep look in each step. The first step, lexer, you can use a module called tokenize. Try to present it. So tokenize take your source code as an input and then generate a bunch of tokens here. And remember, the tokens here have no meaning. And so We have another module called AST serve a purpose as parser. This AST stands for abstract syntax tree, and contains two methods. One is called parse, and the other called dump. And parse can parse your source code again and generate a tree. And a tree can be presented by dump function and generate kind of output like this. And this tree contains the mean. And now you got a tree. How to generate the final output? There are two building functions help you. First is compile. The other one is avo. Compile your tree into bytecode 
and Avo your bytecode, you can generate a final result. And also, if you are interested in the detail of bytecode, you can use a module called this, and this, this fun disassemble function will tag your bytecode as an input and finally generate a step of detail execution. And today's focus will just be the pather. So I talk about the entire compilation steps. However, uh, our focus will just be a parser. If you are interested in other steps, that's not the focus in today's talk. We learned C Python's parser. So we can start to talk about the compiler's technologies. And in parser 101, we will talk about the content in scores lecture. So if you are a computer science student, you may already know it. It's a good chance for you to review it. If you are not, that means you can just learn like a computer science student. And the first essential item called CFG. CFG stands for context-free grammar. Context-free grammar, the grammar can be represented by this gray block. And inside the grammar, usually we have a lot of rules and each rule presented by a yellow block. And in each row, we have an arrow. Arrow means derivation. Some paper may write in the upside, but the meaning is the same. And we have, usually we have two ways to represent uh, in left hand side and right hand side. So the upper case means non-terminal, the lower case means terminal, and non-terminal means it can derive to other thing, and terminal means it's a final token. And we have a bar here. The bar here uh, in CFG means end. So it supports ambiguous syntax because in this case, we can interpret this grammar into both uppercase B and the lowercase A can be derived from uppercase A. And why we talk about CFG here is because in the following talk or in the paper, you often will see a lot of grammar. And so please be sure be familiar with the meaning of each block and what is context-free. Context-free can be explained by following two examples. And simply speaking, context-free disallow any context in the left-hand side. That means left-hand side in all the rules can only contain one non-terminal. So in the second case, that's the invalid CFG because we put some context before or after the non-terminal. And we say that pattern can be can derive to another pattern. That is not a valid case. The valid case, we can only say or a certain non-terminal can derive to another pattern. Now we learn context-free grammar. What's the usage behind that? So context-free grammar usually going through another process called semantic analysis. And in that process, it will use it plus the source code as an input and generate ultimate output called pass tree. And uh, pass tree contains two type. One is concrete type, the other one is abstract type. In the upper part is a concrete type. Concrete type usually is pretty complicated and uh, pretty raw and it's not so human readable. It contains many non-terminal and inter intermediate process going through your grammar rules. And on the upside, abstract syntax tree is much more human readable. So for this example, if you have elementary education background, presumably you know the multiply operation is higher than the plus operation. Depends on the parser implementation we need a treatment on the CFG, and that's called CFG simplification. There are totally three types of simplification we should talk about. First one is ambiguous, second one is non-deterministic, and finally, left the recursion. Ambiguous definition is a grammar contains rules that can generate more than one tree. So for following example, as you can see, it generates two kind of tree if you try to uh, put some practice here. And so 
This is problematic because, as an, any elementary educated people should know, right hand size tree is the correct one, and left hand sized one is wrong. So to resolve this, we need to rewrite the grammar. So after rewrite the grammar, as you can see, we have not only one non-terminal, we use another two, two non-terminal here, try to uh, make this grammar able to represent by one identical tree. And the second simplification is non-deterministic. The meaning is a grammar contains rules that have common prefix. So for following example, a non-terminal A can derive to terminal AB and terminal AC. In this case, because we have the common prefix A, so we can rewrite the grammar with another non-terminal and eventually generate a grammar like this. And uh, the third one, which is also the most uh, challenging one for the parser implementation, is called left recursion. The explanation of this is pretty complicated if you never experienced this before. Uh, if you have a grammar like this, let's say, uh, you know, it's very human readable, right? E can derive to E plus T and, or, uh, and T, and the T can derive to another T, multiply F and F, and F can derive to number. This is a kind of way we, we just uh, explain uh, the, the kind of calculator suppose plus and multiply. However, the problem is, in the implementation, you may meet the problem is, what if you always deal with E first? And you you will meet a problem is, E derived to another E, and later that another E derived to another E, and your program will recursively meet the E, and eventually reach the memory limitation. So unable to parse the thing. That means left recursion. So how to deal with that? Yet again, we need to rewrite the grammar. So after the grammar rewritten, as you can see, it's pretty ugly, not so human readable, but the mean is the same. I'm not going to explain the detail between left hand side and right hand side. I just let you know is uh, if you want to implement the parser in a certain way, then you need to resolve the ref recursion. That means your grammar will be rewritten into a certain way, not so human readable. Let's have a recap here. We have three types of CFG simplification. Here is the before, here is the after. We know CFG and we also know different parser implementation may require a certain simplification on your CFG. And we also know the output is a kind of path tree. So we can start to talk about the traditional parser implementation. Before that, we need to know there are actually two types of parser. First one is top-down, the other one is bottom-up. And top-down parser, it starts from the root and eventually till the leaf and generate the tree. And button up on the upside, it start from the leaf and they go up till the time they can't go up anymore and eventually generate tree from leaf to root. So there are two type of parser based on the two type of uh, classification, right? So the first top parser called LL, second one called LR. LL parser and LR parser's first L stands for left to right. That means they all parse the input stream from left to right. And second L and R means derivation, timing. So in LL parser, it does the leftmost derivation. That means for the first example in left hand side, you can see it's a top down approach, it's the LL parser approach. And with this approach, it meets the plus operator first and later multiply operator. And on the upside, the rightmost uh, derivation, that is the LR parser implementation. In the right-hand side, you can see it 
starts from the leaf to root, and uh, so it meets the operator in the different timing. It meets the multiply operator first, then plus operator second. And finally, the k. k means token look ahead. And following is a kind of example, right? So start from two. Oh, I. If you parse, if you implement a parser, you basically oh, add two. I'm a token of a number, and if I perform one look, token look ahead and meet another token of plus, then what to do next? That is the meaning of the look ahead, right? So we learned LLK and LRK's definition. Now we can move on to take a look at the detailed implementation. And the first one we will take a look is the top-down recursive descent parser, which is also the simplest and the most straightforward one. And for this case, you can see we have three steps in total. The first step is you need to write function for each non-terminal in your grammar. So in this case, we have five non-terminal in our grammar. And remember, this grammar doesn't support left recursion, so it's pretty ugly. And now we have the corresponding function. We can start to parse the string from left to right. And during the time we parse the string, we always need to start from the root. So that means it's parse E. And start from parse E, based on the look ahead, we can decide what derivation we want to proceed and eventually reach the end of the input string. So look at the example code. Here is the area one example. We can see that uh, for the grammar, we have five non-terminal, and we have two examples here. One is parse e prime and the parse t. And in parse t, it's pretty simple. We just have one possibility, one derivation. So there is nothing special. But in parse e prime, because there are two possibilities, so we need to use a k-look-ahead approach. And based on, oh, we look at the symbol, next symbol is plus, so we decide to do derivation. And if we didn't find the plus symbol in next symbol, then we decide to do another derivation. And that is the k look ahead approach in this case, and k equals to 1. Another way to implement top-down parser called non-recursive descent parser. Python's LL1 parser also implement in this approach. This way, we instead need to have a pre-generated parsing table based on your grammar. And this pre-generation requires two steps. The first step is to have a first follow table for each non-terminal. That is based on non-terminal's previous symbol and next symbol. And uh, we collect those information. Later, we can generate their parsing table. And the parsing table basically let you know when I am certain terminal and uh, I need to do, based on the grammar, what action I should do. And so this parsing table basically will need to implement in following step. We have a stack here. And yet again, the first arrow is left to right. And second arrow is the from left derivation to right derivation and from top to down. So as you can see in the beginning, we have the E as the first non-terminal. Later, we start to reduce, reduce. We start to round reduce to till the end. We reach the terminal, and we can shift. And uh, we will keep running this till the end. There is no more symbol in the stack, and we call it accept. That means the, the, the grammar is valid, and we generate the tree. So. In the implementation is also pretty simple. As you can see, we need to have a parsing table here. And then we have a stack. And we also have a pointer to point to the current place. And based on the symbol we meet, we perform shift action or reduce action. And if it's done, we eventually return a root of the tree. Let's take a look at the final traditional parser implementation called LR parser. And LL parser, in fact, is more popular than LL parser, mainly because it accepts left recursion grammar. Let's take a look at the detail. So LL parser, like LL non-recursive parser, we also need to pre-generate some parsing table for the step-by-step -step action. And the thing here is we 
don't use the first follow table, but we use a thing called DFA, deterministic finite automata. So using this DFA based on the state to generate the parsing table. And so in each state, we have a kind of point. And in the beginning, every point is in the start point. And we will take a look at the following symbol and perform the shift action to different state. And if the point reach the end, it will reduce based on the rule. So in this case, we will say, oh, this is the rule five. So we will reduce based on rule five. And in this case, if we are in the beginning, we meet E, then we will shift to state two. And so it's like a kind of workflow. We will keep shifting till the end and uh, reduce based on that rule. And so the parsing table looks similar. As you can see, you have the states here and uh, meet a different symbol, perform shift to different state. And if you meet the end, then you will run the reduce action based on that grammar rule. And so the implementation state by step is also like this. We have the left to right parsing. And then the second thing is the based on the parsing table, we run the derivation from right to left instead. So this is the button up approach. And look at the example code it would be very, very similar to previous non-recursive non one. We also use a stack. And then based on this parsing table here, we run the stack. And uh, when we meet a certain state, we will do the following action, either shift or reduce. And then get the constructor final tree. Great, we learned the textbook content. Let's start something outside of textbook. In the parser 102, we will initially talk about PAG and PAG parser. So PAG stands for Passing Expression Grammar. It was initially introduced in 2002, PAG rate parsing. So the difference between PAG and CFG, there are two differences. First is the rule supports regular expression in PAC. And the second thing, the most important thing in PAC is this bar. The bar means over now. That means PAC no longer supports ambiguous grammar. If the first grammar success, it will not go to the second grammar. So let's take a look at the example. If for grammar one and two, CFG has no difference. CFG will say, oh, A can derive to lowercase a, b, and the lowercase a. But for PAG, it's different. For PAG, PAG will try, for the grammar one, PAG will try, oh, A can derive to lowercase a, b. And if it's success, then I will go for it. I will not go for the second one. Or only if it failed, I will go for the second one. So grammar one and two's meaning become different now. And pack parser. Pack parser means parser generated based on pack. And pack parser can be a pack rate parser or other traditional parser with k look ahead limitation. However, mostly when we talk about pack parser, we mean pack rate parser. What is pack rate parser? Let's take a look. We need to recall one question I mentioned in the beginning. Why Guido choose from LL1 implementation to pack rate implementation? The answer will gradually show up. First thing is the type of pack rate parser is also top-down type. That means the implementation is also similar. There are only two differences in between the LL1 parser recursive implementation versus pack rate implementation. The first thing is the rule now become pack rule instead of CFG. The second difference is when we recursively parse the input stream, we perform infinite look ahead instead of k look ahead. So we look at everything, every possibility, 
And why it's allowed is because we use pack rule. We no longer accept ambiguous syntax. And how do we implement that? We use an approach called memorization. So the implementation is like this. Another important fact why we shift to pack rate is because we can get a super good benefit. Our grammar accept left recursion now. It's like LR parser. And the implementation is also similar. We have a recursive way, but we address a decorator layer for memorization. And then we still run the derivation based on the recursive logic here. To talk about memorization, we need to slightly shift to algorithm 101. So one of the iconic problem called Fibonacci number, you can also find it in code. The implementation can be exponential time approach by some recursive way. So in this recursive implementation, you can see we put a number in this function and uh, this function will call itself with a smaller number until the number is smaller than two, it will return the result. And this approach is very slow because when a given number n is super large, then below generated tree will be super big. And uh, the number will, you know, same number will be calculated all the time because you don't record it anywhere. So the time complexity in this case will be exponential. How to resolve this? We use an approach called LRU catch in Python, just two lines of code. It actually makes you to record the calculation result of function somewhere in the memory. And then you no longer need to calculate the number you have calculated. And the time complexity in this case will from exponential time to linear time. And the space complexity instead will from O1 to OM because you need to store all the calculation result. Right, you understand memorization now. How about left the recursion in pack rate parser? Even with the memorization approach, we still need to handle this. So this approach wasn't introduced initially in pack rate parsing techniques. Instead, it was uh, developed later in the following papers. Um, Guido's post talk about this specifically, so I will follow Guido's post to talk about his idea in CPython. And they, he used a second approach called reverse the call stack. So as previous example give, we, we, we know that we need to write the parse function for each non-terminal. And uh, if we meet uh, this case, right, the first non-terminal will need to parse another same non-terminal and it will recursively call itself and never stopped. And so to resolve this, the approach is we need to have a magic function called Oracle parse E. So in parse E, we actually will not directly call itself. Instead, we will call this magic function. A magic function will help to fill the calculation result in the memory. And then till the end, after finish all the filling, it will return data back. And then when parse E meet the same input again, it will retrieve the result from memory instead of call Oracle parse E. That is the approach. So the normal memorization is pretty simple. If the calculated result is in memory, we return it. If it, we haven't calculated it, then we will just calculate it. But for left recursion one, we will additionally do one more step. We will write one for loop inside. And this loop will try to go through all the possibility from the current index till the end. And after we fill all the data, all the calculated result into memory, we can break. That is the way we handle left recursion in CPython. So we have the knowledge of both traditional parser and pack rate parser now. Let's compare the difference between them. Traditional parser and the pack rate parser both scan from left to right. And pack rate parser additionally need to run the right to left memorization. And for left recursion handling, pack rate and LR parser support that. For the ambiguous side, pack rate parser disallow that. 
And so they are trade off between pack rate parser and the traditional parser. The space complexity, traditional parser is better. In general, because uh, pack rate parsers, space complexity depends on the code size. And traditional parser just depends on the looker has three depths. And but the time complexity side pack rate parser is better because it's uh memorized the result in the memory, so it's super linear time, depends on the state. But traditional parser in this case will be exponential time and also depends on the k. And the capability side, because pack rate parser support infinite look ahead, so supposedly it has more potential than traditional parser. So because of that, we have uh, several new rules in Python 3.10 and later based on PEC. And you can find uh, a corresponding talk this year, presumably somewhere. So I'm not going to talk about detail here. Let's take a look at CPython's PEC parser. And again, PEC parser here means PEC rate parser. C Python parser before 3.8, it uses LL1 parser written by Guido 30 years ago. And the parser requires a further step called CST, so you need to convert CST to AST. And after C Python 3.9, it starts to use PEC parser. So there are three main reasons why Guido choose PEC. Firstly, it's infinite look ahead. That means there it may support more grammar in the future. And secondly, the most important thing, Guido complained multiple times in his median post about the horrible part of left recursion grammar. And now pack rule supports left recursion. That means it's much easier, human readable. And the final benefit is there is no more CST to ASD step. So in fact, it somehow saved the memory in this case. And after CPython 3.10, it drops area one parser support. The best way to learn CPython parser is to play it. You can find it in tools folder. There is a thing called pack generator. And this is exact the thing we talked today, pack parser. It consumes the grammar and generates the parser. So it supports both Python based pack rate parser and C-based pack rate parser. The input is slightly different. For Python's one, it only requires a meta grammar, but for C's one, it also needs a token because uh, you know it, the parser is written in Python, so Python doesn't require a token for itself. And here's an example of the meta grammar. You can see there's a subheader. It will be added in the top of the uh, generated parser file and the some rule. And the rule contains as you can see the non-terminal right and the return type of that rule and the some pack rule divider and that it means uh, or in this case and uh, also the pack rule and because this is sdt so you need to provide some action and the action will be written in python code and output after you input this thing to the pack generator, it will generate a parser out. The parser, as you can see, this is fully generated code and it's well written. As you probably can see in some of my previous example, it's pretty similar, but it's auto generated and uh, it serves the purpose we mentioned before. Let's review the benefit and uh, take a look at the performance result. The benefit of pack parser, firstly, Obviously, it's more flexible because of the infinite look ahead. And secondly, because hardware now is cheaper, so memory is cheaper, and uh, we don't need to worry about the pack rate memory consumption. And finally, the CST construction step was removed. So in the newer implementation, it simplified the workflow a bit. And for the performance result, from PEP 617, it mentions the output was less than 10% difference uh, before and after. They, they capture tons of popular open source programs, try to compare the speed and the memory. So overall, we can say that the benefits of pack parser is much important and the performance is acceptable. So they decide to do this transition.
Finally, we can talk about the tag away. Let's recap first. We learned what is parser in Python. We learned the parser 101, including CFG and traditional parser, and later parser 102, including pack and the pack rate parser. And finally, in C Python, how do we implement uh, the pack parser there and use it? So, people may ask me after this talk, what does that mean for me? And I will say, I verified my understanding. So I kind of hope that if people are interested in the same topic, you should try to get your hands dirty. And the way I did this before is to finish all kind of parser implementation on a legal question called basic calculator. So if you want to learn the thing in the same way, I would recommend you to implement them as I did. And if you need answer, you can check out my parser learning repository. It contains all my implementation for LICO question. And with this approach, you will not just learn it like academically read some paper only, but you will get your hand dirty ready implement result for a real world problem. Finally, let's take a look at appendix. Here are a few related articles including, of course, Guido's PEP parsing series overview. It contains all sort of topic we talked today, such as the initiative, the pen point of original parser, and the detailed implementation, including left the recursion handling of the new parser. Second important person is Brian Ford. He is the author of PEC rate parsing and the PEC. So if you want to read a kind of mathematic proof then his publication would be the thing worth to read. And related talks. If you want to know more about those Guido's posts, he personally gave the talk in a couple of places. The topic is called Writing a Pack Parser for Fun and Profit. That will be the thing worth to watch. And if you want to know more about PAP 617, the other two author. Actually, they was interviewed in podcast It I Need. Their topic is the journey to replace Python's parser and what it means for the future. The content is rich and the contents all sort of detail in PEP 617. And remember, I talk about where is parser in C Python, but I only focus on parser in today's talk. So if you are interested in that diagram, in the completion step, other steps, then here are two talks I recommend to watch. First is Emily's The AST and Me, and second is Alex's So You Want to Write an Interpreter. They both are related to the entire picture. All right, I think that's the end of today's talk. I uh, hope you enjoy the content. For Python and when Guido published the the pick the pick parser the the medium one and I oh I I don't know anything about this I I don't I only know about the just just the EDPF syntax and nothing more and and it's, yeah. it keep me in the dark and yeah it's, uh, honestly the the time what, what how how do I prepare that is uh I, I actually half the job I mean I I just switched from one company to another company during that time and uh, that's actually one of my employment gap. <laughs> And I kind of spent roughly two months in my free time to read a paper and to implement wow. those author. <laughs> so yeah, it's kind so of a long cool. journey for me, but it's kind of really makes me have another deeper understanding of it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I think it's almost time. And Yutin, you can keep your questions coming in. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. once once I just get the session started, you can just put in your questions and Kerr will be there to answer. I hope it's good to go. And hello, everyone. And I welcome you all to the second session in Py uh, PyCon APAC Thailand 2021 day one in programming language tag. Yay! <laughs> and we have amazing speaker and he will be answering all your questions whatever you have and let me just introduce the speaker who is there here to answer your questions and he is Kerr from 
Taiwan. And a little introduction about Kerr is important before people get started punching in their questions. Kerr is from Taiwan and he's currently residing in Japan. Am I right, Kerr? Yes, yes. He's in Japan and he is working with Google. Oh, yes. And he he is he is very good in geo services and related to that. And you can actually go to him if you have doubts regarding that too. And <laughs> Kerr, <laughs> Kerr has been part of PyCon Taiwan and PyCon Japan. And he has been exploring PyCon, I would say. And now he is currently in PyCon IPAC Thailand with us here and with his talk as well. So yeah, let's get started with the Q&A. So before I just get started, get, uh, first I have a question. And I would be definitely coming up with the first question for you. So the, the topic, uh, yeah, the topic Kerr actually spoke about was learn from LL1 to peg parser the hard way. If you really want to uh, look at his uh, talk, I think our moderator Gathak can actually post in the link. Whoever missed can actually look into the link and you can actually go through his speech. And later on, if you have any questions, after post this Q&A also, you can connect with him in the open space and you can ask questions related to his talk if you missed now. So yes, that's the opportunity. He'll be available. So Kerr, first question I have from my side is that how how was your journey with Python and how were you passionate about Python that you started with that? I know your job is not related to that, but how did you start your journey with Python? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. I think I can share one of the uh, biggest patients behind that is uh, I am actually majoring in computer science. So I study uh, you know, as a, just a typical computer science student. However, in the school time, what we learn at there is C++. And uh, it's uh, honestly, it's really painful, especially for a lot of matter, man, man, memory management, kind of those low level stuff and also a lot of pointer kind of things. And uh, at, at school time, actually, uh, I don't think I did a good job in any sort of subject, including algorithm and the uh, data structure, those kind of basic fundamental computer science things. Um, till the time I was in a master's school, I just started to learn Python. And at that time, I just found out like this language really makes me think differently in any sense. It's just like, uh, if I know this language before, I wouldn't be that painful when I learn algorithm because I can just focus on algorithm itself and don't really need to think about those low level stuff. And for data structure, the same. So because of that, I kind of have my passion on it and start to use Python to do all sort of the private hobby, those uh, we call it the side project. The com outside of the company use Python to do something else. And so that's basically my original uh, intention of using Python, learn Python. And ultimately that uh, after I did some open source project, I thought it's successful. I bring that to a community. I found out it's actually failed. And until that time I was involved in the community, initially in PyCon Taiwan. And right now it's just uh, become one of my dreams just to talk, uh, present in different PyCon around the world. Yeah. Wow. This, 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 your, your, your experience, something is similar to mine. Even I got myself so much interested in Python through open source communities because they are the one who guide you really well. And that's how I, I got myself into Python and started coding Python. And yes, any more questions from the spectators here? You can raise your hand. You can put your questions in. Anything possible? Any general question is also accepted, not only like in depth, You, uh, if you are really not aware of what his talk was, you can actually ask him around the talk. Oh. Mm -hmm. Mm 
Yotin, do you have anyone? Okay, there's a question from Yotin Kerr. And the question he asks you is from the talk, if you're going to, if you are going back to learn the L1 parser again, would it, would you do the same way? Wow, this is this is very nice. Perfect. Mm, yeah, it's a great question. Um, I think this question for me, my answer is uh, probably it depends on when, right? If it's back to the, the same time I learned it and there there was zero, almost zero resource uh, specifically provide you a good path to learn it, I think uh, I would still recommend to learn things by my way because it really, it's a kind of simple way. That's also how I learn things nowadays, the, the same. I'm actually working on uh, other pro other topics such as uh, recently is interested in Python dictionary. So I also learned dictionary in a similar way to start to implement dictionary from scratch and they're using a different way to implement the dictionary. And the back to the parser thing, I think I follow the exact same way to just, just pick up the really simple question and the start from there, try to learn like a, in the school time, what kind of academic area things happen there and the start from there to learn it. And that's actually one of the key thing I, I'd like to say is, uh, I personally also want to be a C Python contributor eventually. Uh, I don't do that now. It's mainly because I still feel I had too much, too many things to learn. And for me, I, I'm, I think I, I can see that I'm still young enough. So I do still have time to learn those things. And I also found a lot of great resource. And what I'm doing in the community now is also uh, make those resources even more digestible and uh, just to provide it in the community. So yet again, back to your question, do I do it? Will I need to learn the same way? If I touch some wild area like the pack parser uh, eight months ago, a year ago, then yes, that seems to be uh, the, the, the way I will learn it. But if I touch the same token now, then situation may be different. At least from what I know, there are at least three talks I ever uh, found recently because of Python's pack parser. There are different presenters in different PyCon talk about the same thing. And uh, with those resources, you will actually don't need to, maybe you don't need to spend that much effort like me before to learn the things. But yeah, it's, uh, as, but yet again, it depends on the timing you do that. And that's my answer for that. Thank you. <laughs> Can yeah, I have a follow-up question? <laughs> uh, sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and another thing is, once you, you, I saw that you learned a lot from the from from the from the talks. And how do you keep motivating yourself to learn this such kind of topic? And um, yeah, I, I, I saw it. It's hard to to learn this when you need to to write it from scratch to be it from scratch. So how do you keep motivating yourself to learn it? Mm, motivation. <laughs> That's right. Um, yet another good question. Uh, a tr the truth is that like, uh, if you have time and if your the work you you are working on now couldn't satisfy you, then I think the additional time you have can really spend into some of your interests. And but. Still, the most important thing is to, uh, I think, survive, right? Survive means you need to, at least uh, in your work, you need to perform well, and really, really assure you, you, you can survive in next day. Until that time, and uh, how, th that's a time you can think about your interests. And how I motivate myself is personally because one of the value behind me is uh, looking into the future of humans evolution and the involvement. And because of those interests of my value, I mean, I always say the reason why I survived in the war, one of the values that I want to see what's going on in the future. 
And uh, to see that, uh, I think at least I'm familiar with Python more than others a little bit. So this is the place I can really see like how the situation evolved. And uh, this is one of the reasons of this patient. And, but this is not a, the advice for, advice for you to say you need to follow it. Instead, uh, the best suggestion there is to find out your passion by yourself. And you are here in the PyCon. Why you are here? What do you want? And this is also, this whole sort of thing is really start from internally. Not really somebody can push you to do something. And so, uh, yeah, I, I, can, I can share just the, because of my value and the, because I found how Python helped me in the past years. And so I feel this is definitely something I continuously to do. Yeah, that's a really ambiguous answer for that, sorry. Yeah. Wow. That's okay. That's, that's a really cool question. Thank that you. Was, that was indeed another level of motivation to all the speakers yeah. here and to the spectators who are listening to. I it was it was quite 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 uh, detail <laughs> <laughs> detail information that you gave us, Kurt. Yes. Any more questions from anyone? I can continuously share one thing, maybe. Uh, I recently just uh, moved from one company to another company. Right? And usually in the beginning, it's kind of struggle, especially onboarding remotely. And But the, the thing is, once you find out your paths, and the next thing is really, for me at least, uh, what I'm doing now is to try to find out what I can do in company, but also help the Python community. And so this is all sort of passion behind me. And I can do that because I already find these paths and uh, I already can at least assure, I think it works well and I, I have additional free time. I'm willing to use those free time to my passion. Yeah. Yeah, I think that is that is another thing. I I wanted to actually ask that as a question, but I think you already answered it. <laughs> that is, how do you manage your job and your contribution to the Python community? And you said it well. If you are passionate about one thing and you want to contribute, some or the other way, you'll try you will try to find a free time and you will do it. Right. So that's that's how it is. Thank you, Kerr. And any more questions? We have one more question from Neil. In the oh. chat. Oh, Nell is here. Hey, Nell. Okay, and more question. Okay, he has a question for you, Kar. And the question is from one of the MCs here. <laughs> How will you differentiate context free grammar LL and parsing expression grammar? Nice. How will you differentiate that? He has that question. Differentiate here, I don't really get the context. Can you elaborate more? He is asking, like, how will you differentiate context-free grammar and parsing expression grammar? So he's basically, I think, asking the differentiation between both of them. How will you do it? Uh, so if you talk about, like, what's the difference between them, I, I think uh, my talk actually explained that. There's obviously the, the order's difference. The, when we check the derivation and the, the order matters in PAC, but it doesn't matter in CFG. And if you talk about, if you look at some random piece of code and random piece of the source code and you try to differentiate that, I think it's not really possible, mainly just because you, you wouldn't know uh, that. Uh, likely you need to draw, or draw, you know, in CFG, you need, probably need to draw some uh, deterministic automaton, or, I mean DFA, right? Determin uh, deterministic finite automaton. Try to draw a DFA to see like uh, what's going on in, in the in, entire grammar, but uh, I don't know if this answer your question because to be honest, I don't really know what's the context of this. Okay, Nell, does that answer your question? Nell, okay, okay, he just said hi. <laughs> <laughs> Nell, does that answer your question? Are you satisfied with it? Okay, he said yes. Yep. <laughs> so he okay. is. Okay, any more questions? Anyone from anyone here? Or I would be asking a question. 
Yeah, sure. <laughs> I think I have that. So yeah, now you told us how to get started with this topic, and you're telling what are you going to do. And now I have question is my question is that uh, in future, what is the plan further? You're thinking to act on this particular topic. What are the enhancements that you want to do, or? Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, so for my case, uh, I had to say there is a, a guy who actually trying to do the same thing now, like me, and he, he did even more organized the way. It's I'm trying to touch as various criteria as possible in the C Python uh, internal thing. So things like, uh, for example, I already touched dictionary. I kind of understand how Python implement dictionary. I touched the parser. I also understand it. But how about integer? How about float? How about other other internal things? I my my current plan is just to try to touch them in more deeper level one by one, and uh, that's one of the kind of my private hobby trying to do now. And besides that, what I'm doing on uh, there are a few things I can say. Uh, first is I'm trying to see what kind of uh, a thing called SIMD. It's a parallel programming technique in CPU. And I'm trying to see how Python can, uh, what kind of attempts Python already tried before to apply as IMD. And that's one thing. And the other thing I'm looking into, it's related to one of the company's projects. And it's kind of related to a technology called PyBind 11. And uh, I'm trying to learn in a deeper level how PyBind 11 converts the C++ code into C API code. And so that's two of the topic I'm uh, actually working on now. Yeah. Yes, perfect. See, that is the beauty of Python, the Python. Like you keep exploring a lot of things. If you just learn one thing, it will touch almost all the areas possible. So yes, that's that's nice. Even I'm learning Python 11 now. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> quite a challenging thing, but yeah. <laughs> To be honest, like any anyone else who are interested? Okay, we see Pratshya joining. Okay, anyone else? Any other questions you have, or else it's good to go. <laughs> As I said, you can even you. I think Kurt is always available on the platform. He's the, he's been there from morning, engaging with everyone, and. Yes, he will be answering your questions outside as well. You can connect with him on open space or in Chinese rooms, if you know Chinese or not. <laughs> not a problem, but yeah. Okay, see, I think people people are, I think are just enjoying listening to you, Kar, more than asking <laughs> questions. That's for true. And <laughs> they are enjoying listening to you. That's what is happening. The more So there are no more questions, actually. Okay, there are a lot of thank yous coming in for you and a lot of appreciations. So I think no more questions. Anything else, Kerr, as a closing note you want to tell people? Uh, I think one one thing is if you are in this room, uh, what, I do have one thing. I, I think I will also talk about the same thing in tomorrow's panel discussion. Is uh, one of the things I do hope to see uh, especially when you listen to my talk, is uh, be open-minded and uh, try to touch the things outside of Python. You will find a lot of interesting things there. And yeah, that's my uh, conclusion. <laughs> that's nice. So yes, he says uh, almost the takeaway from his talk would be just be open-minded and try to explore everything, just not what he talk talked about. Yeah. So yes, I think it's good to go. Any 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 anything else anyone wants to say to him or to us? <laughs> okay, I think no more questions. Everyone is just pouring in their thank yous for you. <laughs> <laughs> we yeah, also want to thank you for the organizer, this amazing exactly, event. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> okay, I think no more questions. So I think it's good to go. I think it's fine, Gitak. That we can, yeah. we can. If there are no more questions, I would be really happy uh, to just say thank you so much to each and every person who has joined 
this Q and A session, and I hope Kurt's message was totally understandable, and you were able to get him what he wanted to speak. And and again, any more questions you have, do feel free to connect with him outside this Q and A as well, and just interact, make friends, and get to get to know more about him. <laughs> And yes, that's how it is. Thank you so much again, once again, to all the people who has joined the Q and A, and hope you are having a great time on this platform in the conference as well. So do look out for other talks and Q and A sessions as well. That's what I would like to say. And thanks once again for joining.